Okay, everybody, welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today on our uh, webinar. We're going to discuss uh, Trimble RTK and going from kind of what we've been used to with fixed float and all of the things that have taken us now to um, to this point in time with the ProPoint technology. And we'll talk a little bit about ProPoint and do some um, comparisons. Uh, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, on the uh, go to webinar toolbar, you should see an option where you can ask questions. Um, we will be monitoring questions during the um, presentation. So we may answer some as we go. Otherwise, we will save other questions to uh, to go over at the end. So if you ask a question and doesn't get answered right away, hang tight, we'll get to you at the end. Um, the presenters today, are Steve Richter and Dylan Jones out of our uh, Maple Grove, Minnesota office. My name is Jay Haskamp. I'm out of our Waite Park, Minnesota office. And with that said, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, just do a quick uh, audio check. You guys hear me okay? I can yes, see sir. You loud and clear, yep. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, taking time today to um, attend our uh, webinar. Um, the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to kind of focus on six main things. Um, uh, we're going to go through what I would determine as the uh, major epics and uh, bad pun of epics, but major advancements of RTK uh, innovation. We'll talk about that briefly here to start, and then we're going to get into uh, traditional RTK positioning and how that's a little bit different than uh, what Trimble terms as HD GNSS or precision based uh, RTK. And then we're going to go on to uh, ProPoint and how those things differ. Um, that's going to be kind of our main focus on uh, the first half. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on new satellite positioning signals because they play an important role in this. And I don't think we talk about those enough, um, at least from the, from the manufacturing standpoint. We don't we don't speak to those as, as often. So we want to touch on those today. And then we're going to wrap it up with Dylan. He's going to talk a little bit about how, how this stacked up. Um, we actually took some equipment out in the field. We wanted to run it side by side, do some comparisons to really kind of evaluate the differences and, and talk today about how these things really work in the field differently um, and some things that you would have to pay attention to when you use them. And then we're going to obviously do a, a little summary and uh, a Q&A at the end. So it should take about 45, 50 minutes, uh, hopefully not the whole hour. Uh, and um, um, we hope you guys are able to uh, walk away with some important, um, important information. OK, so let's just do a quick introduction here. Um, a lot of you have been around GPS and RTK a technology, positioning technology for, for years. Um, obviously, it's been around since the early 90s, and a lot of things have changed. Um, um, weirdly enough, some things have not changed at all. So, um, so it's interesting that we are, um, we're getting to this point, and some things haven't changed, and some things have changed drastically. Um, the one big change that I kind of like to touch on is um, as, uh, you know, if we're a land surveyor or been around this technology for a little while, uh, RTK uh, positioning, we really have come to rely on it. Um, I can think of a lot of users, um, a lot of our customers, um, if uh, RTK went away suddenly today, um, we would really have to change the way we do uh, do our work. Um, it's really become a reliant technology for us to do our jobs. Um, we uh, use it, you know, virtually every single day. Um, and um, if it goes down, um, uh, Jay and, and Dylan can can attest to it. We get a lot of phone calls, uh, especially if uh, things aren't working right. Um, and we really want to you know, kind of touch on this initialization concept too during this discussion, because I think that gets lost in, in the shuffle in that we uh, we take it for granted. Um, initializations are, are, in my opinion, <clears throat> if you ever sat through any of my classes, I would have probably have told you uh, the initialization is probably the single most important part 
of an RTK survey. Um, you really, uh, once you become initialized, if you're used to using a uh, an older receiver or even some of the modern receivers that go from uh, from floating to fixing, uh, that that transition is probably the most important part of your survey. So we want to talk about some of that a little bit and and note that some of the some of those techniques, those initialization techniques that were introduced back in the early 90s are still being used today. Uh, they haven't really changed. And um, going to uh, an, a precision-based initialization or a precision-based receiver or, or technology is, is quite a, a quantum leap that Trimble did back in 2012. And these new, um, these new trends to precision-based algorithms with the R10 or the introduction of the R10 and now with uh, Pro point here um, in this new RTK engine is further enhancing how we're doing RTK. Um, however, <clears throat> a lot of the other things have remained the same or have been slightly improved, whether it's going from radio to cellular communications uh, with a VRS type of environment, um, our correction streams going from CMR to CMR plus to now CMRX, um, and then uh, you know even some of the RTCMs being updated to RTCM3. Um, as I noted on the fly initialization, we just kind of take that for granted. But if you were working in the early 90s, you didn't. Uh, that was a, a quantum leap for you. Uh, and I remember those, and I'm sure some of the people on this call probably remember those days as well. Uh, but uh, the receivers also got faster. And, um, and taking advantage of some of these processors, uh, they can do some things now, especially with ProPoint, that we could not do even back in 2012. Um, so uh, those are some of the things I want you to kind of keep in mind as we kind of walk through some of this material. So let's take a quick look at <clears throat> basically uh, what I would say are some of the major epics in RTK innovation. So if you remember the old 4000 SSE uh, or even going back further to single frequency, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a receiver that was in a backpack, typically, when it was used in RTK, uh, or in RTK situations. So the receiver antenna was uh, up on the pole, and it was cabled up. Uh, if you remember these these funneled backpacks, they had a couple camcorder batteries at, at minimum. Probably had four camcorder batteries, because we wanted it to last all day. So our 16-pound backpack became like a 22-pound backpack. Uh, with these four quad camcorder batteries, and that's how we did our surveys. Um, we were, um, you know, quite impressed with having uh, the ability to to uh, measure points at long distances, no line of sight between us and the total station. It really was a quantum leap, and that was kind of our first advent for a lot of people into RTK. Uh, and then <clears throat> the 4800 came along, and the 4800 really was kind of revolutionary at the time. Uh, it was all in the pole. Uh, the battery was inside the the rod, and um, we we basically went from four cables to one. So four cables with the 4,000, um, uh, three if we used a quad camcorder or dual camcorder battery cable, but basically two cables for batteries, one cable for the controller, one cable for the antenna. Where we went to the 4800, and we only had just the one cable for the controller. Um, and that was quite a, uh, a, a, a quantum leap in RTK innovation. And then the 5800 came along and uh, we went cableless. We went uh, cableless with Bluetooth. Uh, the battery was inside the receiver, no longer in the pole. And we continued that with the, um, the R8 series. You have R8 Model 1s, R8 Model 2s, 3s and 4s, things like that. Uh, even the R8S today, um, that is a very similar design. However, the, the guts are completely different. Um, but it, it still was, all of these receivers worked with the same exact model, and that was what we call the fixed float model, where <clears throat> once you got corrections to your base station, uh, your rover got corrections to your base station, it was able to uh, go from a floating mode or about a meter of accuracy and down to this centimeter. It like made this big jump. It went from a foot or several feet to a centimeter. That's not going from two feet to one feet to half a foot to a centimeter. That's going from several feet to a centimeter. So it went from this big, what we call error ellipse or guess to a really accurate guess. 
you know, and the guess was pretty, uh, we would call that initialization pretty reliable, 99.99% reliable, but there was still a little, a little potential for the initialization to be bad. And that technology is still being used today. It's a, it's very, very good technology. It gets better all the time. Um, but that's still that initial uh, floating to fixing initialization requirement of the receiver um, is, uh, it goes all the way back into the early 90s uh, where the 4000 SSC was introduced. Um, then uh, what Trimble did is they introduced this new technology <clears throat> in the Trimble R10 called HD GNSS or High Definition D GNSS. Um, and in this receiver, they did things differently. Um, they went to what they call this precision-based approach where um, you were fixed immediately. As soon as you got corrections from your base station or your VRS, your system was immediately fixed. Um, and all of your results were uh, either um, based on your precision values that you wanted to use as a surveyor, whether they were set in the survey style, style or you overrode them as you measured. Um, and that receiver um, uh, kind of changed how we positioned ourselves or changed the idea or thought process between fixed float and precision based. Then, uh, you know, just recently Trimble introduced this thing called ProPoint and it's been kind of a buzzword. And uh, personally, when I took a look at this um, and saw the way it was being used uh, and the way the system works, um, saw really kind of another revolutionary shift in innovation with RTK. And that's really what, um, what we want to talk about today and how is this uh, so much different than, say, a fixed float uh, receiver. Um, you know, how is it performing? Um, um, and we, in, in the one thing I guess we really want to kind of press upon here, this isn't just a, um, a discussion around RTK innovation, but also best practices in, in some, some respects. Um, because we have to understand as a surveyor, we're going to have potentially uh, field users out there using different pieces of equipment and different technology. And uh, how do we get the same answers? And how do we operate these things efficiently and to the best of our ability? Um, because quite honestly, a Trimble 5800 or 4800 or an R8 that's working in a what we call a fixed float type of scenario is going to operate a lot different than a ProPoint receiver or a Trimble R10 that's doing precision-based GNSS. Um, so we really want to point out what those differences are so that you can be a lot more productive, but also give you some peace of mind on how to use these things properly and get good answers. Um, so one point that I have up here on this slide is that ProPoint is available in a couple of different Trimble models. Uh, the R12 is probably talked about the most, but there's also an R10 model too that ProPoint is also installed in. It is not in the original R10. That is different. Even though the receivers look virtually the same, it is not in the original R10. Um, so you can see that the antenna will, will look in this image the same as the R10, but it is different inside. Um, so how is ProPoint different? Um, you know, so this is what Trimble is putting out there in their marketing message, right? Uh, it's accurate, reliable, productive. And so uh, me, Dylan, and Jay, and a few others, uh, we got to talking about this a little bit. We've been doing some tests. We did a, a tailgate. Dylan and Dustin uh, in our office also did a tailgate on this and showed some differences and, and um talked about that a little bit, but we wanted to dive into this a little bit further and really do some testing and see how um, ProPoint is more accurate uh, and more precise with repeatable results. How is it more reliable in its real-time error estimates? How is it more productive by spending less time on points? Really, how is it doing that? Uh, and can we show that and demonstrate it a little bit? So. This, this re-engineering of this, this receiver and taking advantage of all these things that we've talked about here a little bit, uh, taking advantage of precision-based GNSS, because, uh, because as a manufacturer, Trimble's been working on this for many years. So how can they take advantage of this and make it better? Uh, taking advantage of the uh, ability to have a receiver that is able to process data faster. Because if you think about 
a lot of the things that are happening in the sky, and we're going to talk about that briefly in a moment, but if you think about L5, that's another frequency for this receiver to track. If you think about adding GLONASS, that's another two frequencies for this receiver to track because it's tracking on two frequencies, just like GPS. Um, if you think about Galileo and adding Galileo satellite signals, that's two more frequencies for this receiver to track and, and process. So the, the receiver has to process more data, so the faster processor um, is required. Uh, it's just simply required because we're tracking more data uh, and we're processing more data. Um, so, um, so again, um, it's something for us to think about. We'll dive into that maybe a little bit more here uh, when we talk about satellites. All right, so let's just do a quick review. Traditional RTK, uh, we call this initialization. Again, I, I mentioned this off the bat. Uh, I personally think it's one of the most, if not the most important part of your survey uh, when you're using a fixed float receiver. If we look at this graphic, it gives you an idea in 2D. Um, it's hard to show vertical, uh, especially in the webinar. Um, it gives you an idea of what's really happening when the system is trying to resolve its integer ambiguity. So when it's trying to go from floating to fixing, what is happening? <clears throat> and hopefully you guys, this comes through okay, but you can see these red dots. These are what they call integer candidates for the initialization. So when the system is trying to initialize, this is an R8 or 5800 or a traditional uh, receiver that goes from floating to fixing, not, a, not an HD GNSS receiver or precision-based receiver. This is a floating to fixing system. Okay, what it does is it tries to find where these integers best meet from the, all the satellites in view based on the direction of the satellite signal's wavelength. They have certain uh, wavelength sizes, L1, L2, they're different sizes and where they best meet. And you can see that uh, the system finds an integer candidate that they think is the best match or that where they, all these signals best meet. And it goes from floating, which is this large circle here, to a fixed position. That's how it jumps from several feet to a centimeter or, or uh, around a centimeter. Um, However, when, when a system goes from float to fix, it needs a little bit of time. It does this initialization checking even after it's fixed. And um, it needs a, that little bit of time to become 100% confident in its initialization. Now, we don't think about that when we're out there doing RTK. I can tell you what we're thinking about is hurry up and fix so I can measure. Um, and hopefully a couple of you are chuckling about that because you can relate to it. But essentially, what we're trying to do is, as soon as that system fixes, as a surveyor, we're trying to take that fix and get a shot immediately because we may be in a hostile environment. We may be close to a building or around some trees. And as soon as that thing becomes hot, we're ready to measure and we're going to try to store the point. That is absolutely the wrong thing to do because that is when the initialization is at its weakest. It just became initialized. It hasn't had hardly any time to check itself. And again, we're talking about a floating to fixing system. And because it hasn't had much time to check itself, that is when the initialization is going to be the most vulnerable. So what you'll see is when a system becomes fixed in the traditional sense, and you walk into the woods or you go up against a tree, if it's only been fixed for a matter of seconds or even you know, tens, twenties, thirty seconds, the system a lot of times, if it sees error, will uninitialize. And you'll be kind of fighting that battle between fixing and floating and fixing and floating, and it'll kind of drive you nuts. Um, and, so, and and what's, what's really happening there is, again, we're talking about the initialization just becoming fixed. We don't have a lot of confidence in it. So any error that we see, we're going to pop you out of there. We're going to start floating again. The same thing will happen with a, with an R8 if you're out there surveying and you become initialized, you measure a few points, and the initialization becomes very, very noisy. We get a lot of multi-path or a lot of error. You'll get a message on your controller that'll say initialization lost due to high RMS, and it'll actually give you this message and tell you how many measurements you've made. It'll say number of points shot, three, and it's a message that just doesn't go away. You have to actually accept it. You have to say, yeah, I read your message. I know what that means. 
Well, what does it really mean? Have you ever thought of that? What, what does that message mean? Does it mean all your shots are bad? No. All it's doing is it's telling you that the initialization didn't have a lot of time to become 100% confident. So the initialization that you lost, because it didn't happen very long ago, you'll only get that message if you lost initialization within about 10, 15 minutes of that initialization, and it becomes very, very noisy. It won't typically do that if you have it for an hour, okay? But it will do that if your initialization time is very short. And it's telling you that the initialization became noisy, it lost it, and its original initialization is suspect. And it's actually gonna flag those points when you dump them into TVC. And it's just warning you, you should check those shots, or check one to make sure that your initialization was good. Because of this process, because this particular initialization that it thought it was very confident in could have been wrong. And it could have actually been this one over here. So it's just something to think about with the traditional ambiguity resolution of what's going on and why some of those things happen. And this is what you'll see in the field. <clears throat> on your data collector screen, you'll see a fixed message to tell you that the system went from floating to fixing. It'll give you a a uh, accuracy or excuse me a precision value and it'll give you an rms and note that when you're doing uh working with a system that is floating that when it says floating over here you're not going to get an rms you're only going to get an rms when you're fixed and that rms is just a measurement of multipath or error it's inherent in every shot you can't get rid of it the only thing you can do as a surveyor or, or a person that's using rtk measurements is minimize it um, it comes from the ground, it comes from a chain link fence like you're seeing in the background, it comes from trees, it comes from buildings. Uh, RMS is just error. And that error has to be as small as possible for you to maintain the most precise measurements as possible. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about here, and Dylan's going to show this in just a little bit, is what is that really? Ha what happens when you go into the woods, or going up against a building, or, or, or getting some of these environments that aren't as GPS friendly or GNSS friendly? Okay. The one thing to note here is when you are seeing RMS uh, with a traditional fixed float receiver, like I've noted here, an R8, an R7, an R6, an R5, an R4, or 5800, 4800, if you're still using one of those you will um, see an RMS and a precision value. When you dump that into TBC, it's going to take that RMS and it's going to recalculate those precisions with the RMS included. So if you stored a measurement at one centimeter by two centimeters in the field, it's gonna be a little bit higher when you dump that into TBC because the RMS is gonna be recalculated within those values. Okay, so just make a note of that. Now, quickly, precision-based RTK, um, same t uh, same technique, right? We're seeing the same satellites, we're seeing the same wavelengths, but instead of trying to find the best energy candidates, and it's going to be hard to see in the webinar, but you'll see that some of these lines do not intersect very well. Like this one does really well. Uh, this one does horribly. Um, what it's doing is it's basically instead of looking for the best possible answer. It's using all of those energy candidates, and as long as we have five satellites, we have an overdetermined solution, it can report out an encapsulated distribution of error estimates or error candidates as an ellipse, just like we would if we did a static survey measurement, okay? And initialize as soon as you get corrections, and that initialization is going to be a precision based on how, what the environment is, is telling you. So basically what we're doing here with the precision-based RTK that we're not doing with fixed float is we're including the RMS or we're including the bias, of the error. That's really, really important because that allows a system to fix immediately upon getting corrections and give you answers relative to what's really happening in the environment. Maybe it's really crappy environment and your precisions are gonna be two tenths of a feet, uh, or two tenths of a foot, sorry. And that's really what's going on in the environment at that time. And that's what a precision-based RTK or an HDGNSS receiver will do differently than a float fix. You don't have to wait for it to go to a fixed mode. It's already there. And the error is determining how precise 
your measurement is or how precise the environment is. So they do operate differently. If I was a user and I was out going outside and was going to use an R8 that goes from float to fixed, I would use that differently because I'm really concerned about the initialization, how long I've had it, and the RMS. Compared to if I'm using an R10 in the field, I'm going to use that a lot differently because the initialization is already happening. I don't have to worry about that as much. What I have to worry about is the air and the environment. And sometimes maybe I have to reset my satellite tracking in the woods because that's where it needs to re-initialize, uh, as you would call it, recapture those satellites and determine what that error looks like because it's going to be a lot different in the woods than it's going to be if I'm out in the open. And this is what you're going to see in the field then. So if you're using an HD GNSS receiver, whether it's a Trimble R10, uh, even R10 Model 2 or R12, because it also uses HD GNSS, it just has ProPoint, is <clears throat> it's going to reduce that RMS in the field that goes away, and all you see are precision values. So if I'm in the wide open and I set an R10 next to an R8, the precision values are going to be different because one includes the RMS and one does not. So that's very important to know. Now with ProPoint, we're talking about more confidence, improved performance, it's a better processor, um, and the precision-based initialization is the same as it would be with the R10. Okay, There's no RMS in the field. Okay? We're not seeing that like we would with an R8. With the R12 or an R10 Model 2 that's using ProPoint, you're going to see, just like the R10, uh, no RMS, and your precision values are going to have that reduction done in the field for you with improved performance. Okay. So, so why ProPoint? So these are all the things that Trimble's saying about ProPoint. And without um, the receiver looking a lot different, it becomes uh, something where... Uh, boy, you really want to test this because it looks the same as an R10, but uh, how is it really that much different? Um, so a couple of things that, that, they're, that they're doing is, is a totally different engine design. Uh, it's, even though the, the housing looks the same, the design is totally different. Um, ProPoint is doing something also a little bit different. It's taking all of the track signals and inputs and it's determining with its um, modeling, this noise modeling that it's that it's using that's different. Um, it's determining what the best satellite geometry is and the best quality of those satellite geometries and it's creating a better position and coping with that situation where you're getting some multipath, you're getting some air, the signals are coming through the woods or up against the building. And it's basically coping with that situation better um, based on this new ProPoint engine that it's using. Okay. So it's taking that HD GNSS and taking it one step further and processing that data better, modeling the noise better, and doing a better job of determining what those solutions and precisions look like in the field. We would not be able to do this without precision-based GNSS. So one other quick aspect that we have to take into consideration here, are the new satellite signals, um, three, three of them that we really see that, that are impacting the market, two of them today, one in the future, L5, Galileo today, Budai probably in the future. So we're just going to focus on talking about quickly L5 and Galileo, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dylan. Okay. Um, so L5. So why is that important? Well, basically, it takes GPS L1C and L, uh, L or excuse me, L1 and L2. We'll just call it that, and it adds a third observable. So basically, it takes a dual frequency receiver and it makes a triple frequency receiver. So if any of you remember using RTK when it's single frequency and you had to do known point initializations to dual frequency where initializations happened on the fly because you're adding that second frequency. Think of the third observable as checking that, that initialization. 
So it's ultra, ultra, ultra important. This is going to have a major impact on land surveying or using RTK. We have 11 L5 satellites today, 24 planned by 2021, which obviously we're not going to hit that target. But today we can use L5 as a third observable on 11 satellites, and that's huge. That's not just for a, a pro point receiver or an R10. That's also for any receiver that can track L5. And there are quite a few, and I'll, I'll note those who are here in a second. The other quick thing I want to say about L5 that's really an advantage for land surveying and working in some hostile environments is the the 1176.45 megahertz that it's traveling on, that band, is creating a wider or a wider bandwidth between L1 and L2, which copes with these types of environments better. Okay, right now, those L1 and L2 are closer together. The bandwidth is smaller. It cannot penetrate trees. It cannot penetrate buildings, things like that, where L5 is going to do a much better job of that. Okay. So uh, the other one is <clears throat> Galileo. Um, Galileo has got 22 current usable satellites. 30 is considered a full constellation, so they're very close to a full constellation. Okay. Um, and having the Galileo now come in and provide another uh, tracking mechanism, just like GLONASS did 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, is going to enhance your positioning for RTK. Um, and what we've seen, it's, it's really, really enhanced in some of these uh, non-GPS friendly environments. Uh, one thing to note here on your controller, the, the code for Galileo satellites is an E. So you've got G GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. They all start with a G. So GPS are your GPS satellites. R is your GLONASS satellites. And E is now your Galileo satellite indicator. So please note that that's something that's important in the field when you're looking at what satellites you're tracking. Okay. So G for GPS, R for GLONASS, E for Galileo. And then, like I said, I wanted to make a quick note um, on what receivers support L5 and Galileo. Uh, I know a lot of us have mixed fleets, uh, all the way down to maybe even R8 Model 1s, 5800s. Uh, they do not track L5 or Galileo. Uh, R8 Model 2 or higher supports L5. Obviously, all the R10, R, R12 series reports, uh, supports L5. As far as Galileo, you can get it as an option in the R8 Model 3. It's already in the R8 Model 4 and R8S, and then obviously R10, R10 Model 2, and R12. And if you want to utilize those signals, your rover not only has to be able to track those signals, but your base or reference station needs to as well. So if you're using VRS, you need to confirm that your VRS can use it. If you're using... Um, a base station, you need to confirm your base station is uh, tracking and supporting those as well for you to take advantage of them at the rover. So that's also an important note there. So again, why ProPoint? So that's what we really wanted to find out. You know, um, is it really that much better? Um, does it perform that much better? Obviously with precision based, uh, it should perform better. Um, uh, and this new, um, uh, this new engine that Trimble has produced. Uh, we want to see it perform better. We want to see it be more reliable. Uh, we want to see it um, be more productive. And uh, those are some of the things we set out to do the other day. So we did a little bit of testing. Um, so Mr. Jones, uh, are you still on the call? You want to talk about some testing? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, one other thing that I also wanted to touch on in regards to all the signals and satellite constellations with the ProPoint technology um, is the fact that it's signal agnostic. Um, so one of the one of the other reasons that it is you know pushing the envelope for being more productive in the field is that we aren't limited to a minimum requirement of a certain uh, signal or a certain satellite constellation. Um, so it, it's able to take a big a more broad picture of, of any, anything and everything that it can see 
and really boil that and reduce it down to the position. Um, so that's another really big thing in regards to the pro point versus what uh, some of the other um, or all the other Trimble receivers haven't had in the past. Awesome. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah. And um, so in regards to what we did for testing and and again, in, in regards to testing, we aren't finished testing. We're going to be um, continuing um, kind of pushing the limit uh, with this new technology. Uh, so by all means, we aren't we aren't finished, you know, providing results and um, and, you know, coming up with absolute conclusions at the end of the day, uh, as we just finally got leaves on the tree up here in Minnesota. And, um, you know, now's, now's a good time for us to continue our testing and, and providing those results to um, our fellow customers and colleagues. For the testing that we did uh, in preparation for this webinar, um, what we really wanted to prove here was the differences between our fixed float receiver versus our pro point r12 receiver and um, so we went head to head uh, steve versus dylan and um and we did just that we took back-to-back -to -back observations uh, so there wasn't really any time delay or time um, interval between his shot and my shot where the satellites might have shifted or moved in the sky um, but we did want to compare the r8s versus the R12 with the ProPoint technology. And um, of course, using a TSC-7 with Trimble Access for capturing uh, the data. The, uh, the time on the point, precision values and the repeatability is what we are really after. And so with our results here that we're going to show you, um, hopefully you can get a good idea of, of, of just that. So um, you can go to the next slide there, Steve. All right. so. Um, in regards to just out in the open measuring, um, we started out here with uh, what we call 0.100, and um, and so out in the open on a control point that we that we knew established coordinates for, um, we were using our VRS uh, our VRS system here that we have in Minnesota, which is equipped with GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, L5, um, and comparing uh, what we came up with for horizontal and vertical precisions, number of satellites, uh, number of measured epochs within our precision, and uh, the duration that it took in order to achieve the required number of epochs. Um, and so we set our manual precision for our topo point at one centimeter horizontal by two centimeter vertical. Um, and so out in the open, here are the results that we have uh, comparing the r 8 and the R12. You can see very very similar answers um really no distinguishable difference between the two out in the open based on what we saw now getting into a little bit more challenging environment um, where we have uh, building and tree right next to our measured point uh, we set a hub in the ground uh, still using the same vrs network um, same precision requirements uh, we have uh, pictures there to show you on the right there, uh, myself up on the top with the R8S, Steve with the R12 on the bottom, and um, really highlighting here at the bottom in the results, the um, R12, um, we, we, were, we saw horizontal precisions of uh, right, right around 25 thousandths and uh, 36 thousandths vertical, and uh, we've got uh, fairly similar number of satellites. However, the epochs and the duration is what you really need to look at here. Uh, this is where the productivity of the R12 really outshined the R8S in this environment. So uh, five second duration to achieve five epochs of, of measured information versus zero epochs within our tolerance and 29 second duration. What that means is at that 20 sec 29 second duration, I force stored the shot, um, but you can still see the, the calculated horizontal and vertical precision was still somewhat acceptable. Um, it just took a lot more time to achieve um, or force store the point uh, based on the fact that we didn't have any epics within our required one centimeter by two centimeter tolerance. 
And Dylan, you know, we talked uh, earlier about fixing and floating <clears throat> and uh, the R12, obviously uh, it's fixed as soon as it gets its corrections. Uh, one thing we didn't note is how long it took to fix. Um, and I'll say in every environment uh, that we're gonna demonstrate, the R8S did a pretty admirable job of fixing. Um, we didn't have to wait very long. Um, and, uh, you know, once it became fixed, um, the biggest thing, like he just said, the precisions never got to our one centimeter, two centimeter within 30 seconds. So he just forced stored and wanted to see what the differences were. So I think that's important because I know that that happens in the field. Guys just do that. Yeah, I know a lot of people will probably comment that, uh, you know, one centimeter by two centimeter might be uh, well within their normal tolerance. Um, so, of course, we could have set those manual precisions up a little bit higher, and I'm sure we would have seen um, maybe some epics in here uh, for the R8S and uh, a, a smaller duration. Um, but for this testing, we really wanted to see if we could achieve the one centimeter by two centimeter uh, within an, a respectable amount of time. So that was our first kind of test point where we uh, were putting the receivers to a uh, challenge. Our second point here, um, again, in some tree canopy, not as many leaves on this tree, um, but a moderate challenge, I would say. Um, again, we have pictures there on the right showing you kind of the, um, the environment, um, but surprisingly uh, in this environment, both receivers performed pretty, uh, pretty respectably, uh, you know, similar to each other. So um, within the five, six seconds, we were able to achieve our required number of epics. Um, you even see there that the R8S saw two additional satellites compared to the R12. So, um, you know, kind of take that as, as you want, but uh, we did see slightly lower uh, horizontal and vertical precisions calculated for the R12 in that environment. On our third point, um, this is probably our most challenging environment we had uh, brush behind us, a uh, large uh, coniferous tree in front of us, another uh, kind of larger broadleaf tree to the left. And um, this is where uh, another instance where the R8S uh, simply just could not achieve um, uh, the required precisions. Uh, so we ended up with zero epics within that requirement and a duration of 30 seconds. Again, that's where I just forced stored the point. Uh, but still, our, our calculated horizontal and vertical precisions uh, are falling within uh, a tenth of a foot. Um, again, all these measurements here are in feet uh, for those of you who are more accustomed to meters. Um, sorry, I can't really do the calculation on the fly um, that quickly. And then our fourth point here, again, very kind of similar to the, to the previous, um, but uh, two coniferous trees, one on each side. Um, fairly tall trees, and um, uh, actually in this instance, we uh, achieved our requirement of three epics, and uh, and that was for both receivers. However, the R8S achieved it within six seconds, um, and the R8S uh, right at that 21 second mark achieved its third and final epic that was uh, within our required precisions. The one thing here, Dylan, if you could go back one screen, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you. <clears throat> we didn't highlight any of the coordinates. The reason we didn't do that is because we were looking for differences between the R8S and the R12 or Pro Point uh, to be more than a tenth of a foot. We thought um, that would be a good just test to see how well they repeated. Um, and we didn't really have, I think this is the worst if you look at the vertical, 915.95 versus 916.05, and that's a tenth. Uh, we didn't have anything fall outside of a tenth of a foot difference. Um, so even though in some of those instances where the R8S didn't get any of the epics within its required precisions, it still recorded a very precise measurement. Um, and I think that needs to be pointed out. And, and, and I, I personally think that has a lot to do with L5 and Galileo tracking, uh, included where, where it normally wouldn't have been um, um, with a lot of uh, systems. So uh, again, I just wanted to point that out. I thought that was also important to take away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the R12 and, and the R8S definitely performed uh, well within, you know, the same result and 
uh, coordinates at the end of the day. Um, it's just uh, kind of a matter of how fast each one got there and if it uh, if it met within our you know our certainty of that one centimeter by two centimeter you know idea of when we're out in the field we want to make sure that we're confident with our measurement. So some things to consider, especially um, in this instance where we have a pro point receiver versus a uh, float fixed receiver. Um, in the topo point settings in the survey style, and this is kind of highlighting what we had here, we, we chose to auto store the point once it achieved um, a five second occupation time and three epics or three measurements within our manual tolerance here. So. Um, just pointing out where we went in to set that tolerance and to set our topo point settings. Um, and then we also chose, um, this is actually kind of important in, in an instance where you have a float fixed receiver. Uh, if, if you want to be able to store a non-RTK uh, non initialized point, you would have to, um, you would have to remove that check mark. Otherwise, uh, it, the software isn't going to allow you to store if you're um, in float mode, so to say. So um, we did not ground truth in this instance. We have done some other testing in, in regards to how well we hit within control. Um, but again, just kind of highlighting we came up with very, very similar answers for coordinates at the end of the day um, when comparing the two receivers. Um, so just, you know, the kind of the overall things here with what we saw in our testing, we did require uh, a force store on two of the R8S points, uh, zero of the R12 points. Um, it actually achieved within our tolerance every single time with the R12 uh, within the five seconds and three epics. Um, but we definitely did, did attribute a lot of that success on both ends uh, due to the fact that we have the capabilities of, of using Galileo and L5 signals in our solution with our VRS network. Um, so we are very pleased to see that. And um, by the way, just a, a little plug here, Trimble Access does give you the ability um, in, in version 2020 to change your precision values from a DRMS to a one sigma to a two sigma. Uh, so what that means is we can actually alter inside of the job units settings, uh, what it reports for confidence uh, level for our precision values at the bottom or the top of the screen. Okay, so if we wanna see 95% confidence in the field, um, Trimble Access now gives us that flexibility within our units to display a 95% confidence um, in our precisions, which is really awesome and something that a lot of people have requested in the past. I'll kick it right back over to Steve here to give us a summary and, and we'll, and we'll uh, answer some of your questions. Thanks, Dylan. That was good. Hey, um, so we got uh, a little bit of summary and a q and I think we're uh, about 10 minutes from being done. Um, so again, you know, ProPoint does provide that RTK confidence. I think we, we could show that. Um, we definitely saw the differences between the, um, the number of epics within our tolerance, one centimeter by two, and then the amount of time it took uh, to get within those tolerances. In some cases, we couldn't get there. We had to four store. Um, so definitely saw the confidence. Uh, the reliability uh, factor was there because we were able to repeat measurements with another receiver. Uh, we felt like we could uh, we could do that as well. Uh, so some of the things that we're talking about here are definitely able to uh, to uh, do with the pro point. Um, and then I also want to say, uh, you know, the the fixed float works. It's very very good. Uh, it does a great job if it's used properly. Uh, and we were able to prove that in these scenarios. So uh, very happy to see that. Um, it's funny because we did a little. Um, uh, me and Dylan did this test, but then we demonstrated this to Jay yesterday when we uh, we did a little uh, run through on this PowerPoint, and uh, he uh, he even said I was pretty surprised. That's not what I expected to see. Uh, so hopefully uh, hopefully we surprised a few of you with uh, with uh, what we came up with in this test, um, and even those adverse conditions, uh, you know, RADS did did great. But again, I, I feel L5 helps a lot with that, and so does Galileo. 
Uh, it's not going to be that case all the time. Um, so uh, with that, I think um, we could probably answer some questions. Uh, Jay, do we have some questions? Are you still with uh, us? Yeah, we have, we have a few. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, a couple of them here. Um, the first one um, from John I'll cover first just because we might need um, just some more information from him. So we'll give him a chance to, to send some more. But he's saying that he's heard uh, through the grapevine that ProPoint has had some issues in certain areas. Is that the case? If so, what's the cause and what will make it more reliable? So I guess if he could be, I, I haven't heard that. I don't know if you guys have, but my thought is if he had some examples. Um, but not. maybe just maybe just reiterate, you know, what would make ProPoint more reliable. Um, I think we covered that with the with the signal tracking and L5 and, and Galileo. But um, John, if you want to elaborate more, feel free to to, to add another uh, bit to that. Um, but the next one is from Bruce, and he says, um, "Fix so fixed float is not like a light switch being on or off. Many times in hostile environments, like an active runway." I'll take the shot seconds after getting fixed, and I assume I am good. What kind of potential error am I looking at with this quick shot? Yeah, I mean, it's tough to say. I mean, I would assume you're good, too, because the precision values are telling you that. Um, a quick check that we've always taught is just to do an initialization check while you're there. So if you initialize, you shoot a point, uh, go into the survey menu under initialization and do a known point initial, initialization on that same point, you should be able to repeat it. If you can, then I would be pretty confident you got a good measurement, especially if you can't hold initialization very long and you know the environment's hostile. That's when I would use that technique. So again, that's in the survey menu, under initialization, go to a known point initialization, say I want to initialize on the point I just shot, which you can do, and it should it should initialize on it. If it doesn't, then that probably tells you that you had some error, and you should you should reobserve. Um, that's personally the technique I would use. I don't know, if Dylan and Jay, you guys trained. You guys do anything different? Uh, I would do the same thing. Um, you know, we we do that a lot up here. You know, with section breakdowns and stuff, where we see everybody just pulling a receiver out of the truck. You know, at a section corner, hit it, and then a you know an intersection and and throwing it back in and you know it doesn't it loses initialization in the truck but you have you know that maybe 20 30 seconds there and that's what i've always taught is just to right after you shoot it do a known point in it and see if it checks out and then at least you have the confidence that it's that it's good or no if it's bad um okay next one here is uh pro point working together so, so is ProPoint working together with VRS like some of the states are using, or is it independent in all satellite solution correction based? Trying to understand. Okay, so he's just asking. I think he's your base has to have a ProPoint receiver. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, but I think he's I think um, he's maybe a little confused with RTX too. But yeah, ProPoint will work. It's it's based in the rover. It could be. Right. Yeah, so you VRS could, or a base you could yeah you could have a base station that's an R8 Model Three that's tracking L5 and Galileo broadcast that to a ProPoint receiver and take advantage of ProPoint at the rover. It's in the rover. Right. Um, another one I, I did answer, but I, I, I will address it here just because I think it is it, it is relevant because um, we could ask this a lot. But the question was, when should you use uh, reset RTK and when should you use the reset SV tracking? Um, when in harsh environments to reset your solution. So example, working in a wooded area. Um, and and ultimately, you know, the, the end solution from reset RTK and reset SB tracking is, you know, is, is the same thing. You're reacquiring initialization. Um, the difference between the two is the reset SB tracking is where it'll actually drop all of your satellites and reacquire them. And the big difference between the two per, per what Trimble tells us is that if you're in a harsher environment, like you're stating with, you know, wooded area or whatever that it's not recommended to do the reset SV tracking. Um, so if, if you're if you're in an okay environment, you can certainly do that. But reset RTK is actually what um, what you should be using. Um, and that looks like the, the last question I have here from Michael is the new TDC 600 with 20 access 2020. Does it uh, support ProPoint? 
So again, the probe point is in the receiver. <clears throat> so it's in the R10 Model 2 or the R12. So if you have a TDC 600 and you have Access 2020, as long as you're hooked up to a probe point receiver, it would support it. So that would even be true if you are running, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe a TSC3 with Access 2017.24 and an R12, and you would get pro points still. It's in the receiver. Yeah, I, I do believe I saw in re, uh, release notes somewhere that there were some instances of different, or there were some differences between um, a 2017 version of Trimble Access, so someone running a mm -hmm. TSC3 or Yuma 2 tablet versus someone that's running a version 2018 or higher. Um, so there must be, I think there are some differences uh, that has something to do with the version of Access, but in regards to, you know, the direct question, yeah, I believe 2020 on a TDC 600 should be just fine with the Pro Point. Right. Right, and I actually will confirm that because I have used used it with an R10 Model 2, and it's actually worked surprisingly well. So definitely, definitely will work. And then one other comment I did actually get across the hall here from from West who was just to mention that you know, the R8S that you guys did use in your test was running latest firmware. So we have to also consider you know, with float fixed and, and looking at more legacy receivers, um, that the age of that receiver and the firmware loaded might also have an impact on on performance too. So you might see a different with an R8S with 545 versus, you know, an R8 Model 2 with version 4 or something. So it right. all kind of is, it's, it's kind of fluid depending upon the situation. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about me and Dylan went into this process wanting to prove or disprove <laughs> the you know the reliability the productivity uh, messages that are out there on ProPoint and and how is it really doing that and I think what we've determined is it's doing that through uh, a more precise measurement uh, and and the, the occupation time in those harsher environments those are the two things that we were able to repeat if that makes sense okay it looks like that's all the questions so um, that's everything we got on the board here. Cool. Yeah, if anyone is looking for um, any more information on this, uh, Steve mentioned it before, but there is a uh, tailgate video on our YouTube channel uh, where Dustin, Har, and myself uh, kind of put the two uh, same exact receivers to the test in, in uh, challenging environments. And it's more of a, I guess, a playful or fun uh, type video for you guys to check out, um, but uh, yeah, definitely just some more content for you guys to to view and and uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I have. Yeah, and that's uh, the more information on ProPoint is on uh, the Trimble website r12.trimble.com. So you can check it out there if you want to get more. You know, they got a video out there and all that stuff. But um, yeah, hopefully you found today informative. I appreciate everybody uh, taking the time today. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.